Adam Sathopoulos and Josh Vegan come together in an incredible podcast, Grow, Scale, Master, an energetic approach to drive progress, master skills, build strengths, and put the strategy back into rapid business and personal success. Backed by real-world experience in rapid scaling, to playing the long-term game of business, it's the story of all the lessons learned on the journey to mastery. Be inspired, renew your energy, and chase the future with Grow, Scale, Master. Con, let's talk about the power of vision and like a united vision inside of a business is a really important thing. And watching, you know, what you've done inside of your group is pretty amazing about the importance of setting that vision. And I was in a session with you a, a couple of weeks back and you'd come out and, and you'd said, you know, guys, this is the number of sales that we're going to do and the number of properties under management that we'd like to get. Um, I have no idea how we're going to do it, but I know that every single one of you is going to be involved with it. And it was actually a really euphoric moment because you could see a lot of people like really uniting around that vision because it wasn't about what the leader wanted to do. It was about where we're going and the size of our markets and what's potential. How important is it for people to have that united vision when they're working inside of a business and particularly, you know, playing inside of that leadership role? Uh, Josh, I think it's critically important because uh, human nature, we want to be part of something that's bigger than us. So that's why you've got um, people that can combine, they can put their energy together, they can put all of their efforts into one single vision that's going to enable them to be able to do things that they didn't think that they could actually achieve. So for us in our marketplace, we never thought that we had the ability to be able to do what we've done in such a short period of time. But when you unite people with a very clear goal, a very clear vision as to where you want to get to, break it down into a mission on how we're going to do that and get everyone believing that they play an important role, that's when the magic happens. It's kind of like this whole idea about, you know, climbing Everest. And if we're really clear about, you know, trying to make it to the summit, that you, you're, you're going along and you say, okay, great, where are the milestones going to be? You know, base camp, camp one, two, three, four on the way. Yeah. And what actually happened, I think, during a lot of the COVID era is, is that, you know, the fog kind of came in and you couldn't actually have that vision because the rules changed so quickly at the time and ultimately what ended up happening is literally you just had to focus on one step at a time and what I've noticed with a lot of businesses is that they've never looked back up again since that fog has cleared and actually started to realise that hey you you are the one that actually sets the vision Yes. so if you set the vision for your personal business around what it is that you're going to be doing if you're working inside of a larger business it's really important not only set it but also to remind people about it now, Con, we talk about a, a title called CRO, Chief Reminding Officer. How important is it to remind people what the vision is to make sure that you've got that unification of people inside of the business? I think it's um, uh, as important as reminding people about their own personal visions. In our business, what we've been able to do is break down what it is that someone wants to actually achieve for themselves. So we use real estate as a vehicle for changing life. So if I can build a vision or help you create that vision or get clear around what it is that you would like, that then cascades up to what we can do as a group. So as a as a combined effort, if we've got 100 people that are pushing up in the same direction, then ultimately the vision of what we're trying to achieve is getting achieved because everyone else has their own goals, their own visions that are being met, if that makes sense. So for us, um, reminding people, that's a, a team meetings, one-on-ones, that's a constant, uh, I guess, Um, reminder of where we're heading, where we are, where we're heading, how we're going to get there and what that means to them. Yeah, there's an old school story too where you always say that literally sometimes you've got to remind people 14 times before they hear it for the first time. And so the great mistake that a lot of people make inside a business is they think that they've set some sort of a vision. You know, it sits inside of the employment agreement. It was set back at a kickstart in, you know, 2004 and doesn't need to be set again. And, And, you know, I think that one of the great challenges is that sometimes people forget how to actually go and set that vision because ultimately there's a big number but if you actually don't back that up with infrastructure and people and conversations and training and development and ideas and innovation and creativity, then ultimately how are you going to go and chase it? So this is interesting because like inside of a, being a business leader, sometimes you walk into a business and there's a lot of learned history. No doubt that happened for you, right? When, when you got into the position of ownership inside of your business, it had been going on as an entity well before you turned up. Yes. Was there learned history that was inside of that business before you got there? Oh, absolutely. And I think there was learned behavior as well. So, you know, we started our journey at Parramatta. Uh, with five agents doing 99 sales. Today, we've got 23 agents doing in excess of 700 sales. So for us, we had to act, behave, uh, and actually, you know, um, work collectively as a unit with one single vision, which was to be able to get our market share back up, to get some trust back in, into our communities, to be able to see us as someone that was a real alternative to what was out there. But more importantly, what we needed to do is get our agents to have their very clear vision as to what they wanted their lives to be, 
as I said earlier, using real estate as a vehicle for change. So the biggest thing that I've seen is I can have a vision of numbers. You know, I want to do X amount of sales, X amount of GCI, et cetera. It means nothing until that other person actually is connected to their own vision and then they can essentially, you know, tow to, um, to what we're actually trying to achieve as a collective. So, you know, you've heard that saying that the team always outperforms the individual, but the individual needs to do their job. If the individual does their job, they've got a very clear plan as to where they want to go in life. They've got a very clear plan as to how they're going to operate their real estate business. And then they're working towards a common vision. That's where the magic happens. And that's what's happened with us. If we had gone to day one at Parramatta with you, did you think that where you're at now was actually going to be possible on day one? Yeah, absolutely not. No. Uh, um, to, to, to be really frank, I didn't know what to expect going into Parramatta. I knew that there was an underperforming business. Um, great brand, great people in that business, but there was, you know, a lack of leadership and a lack of clarity as to what the opportunity was. And I think uh, very, very quickly, once I got um, a lay of the landscape as to where my people are at, what they needed to be successful for them, uh, not for us. So our, our kind of philosophy, Josh, is we want people to have the best for themselves. We don't want to get the best out of them, if that makes sense. I know it sounds mm-hmm. a little bit funny, but I'm not here trying to work out how much I can squeeze Josh to be able to you know, get the business to perform better. If I can help Josh get really clear about what he wants in life, and then I can overlay that with systems, technology, people, process, et cetera, then that's how we both win. So when we, when we walked into Parramatta, we saw that there was a market there that was quite immature, just in terms of behavior. There was no real process around prospect list or sell. There was no leverage. Um, and there wasn't one united team that was actually going out to market demonstrating that, um, you know, one plus one equals 11. So we made that very clear that our, our biggest lever was going to be teamwork and the way that we behave out in our communities at open homes, auctions, uh, the way that we actually, you know, work with buyers and leverage them from one campaign to another, et cetera. And I think um, that's what's been one of our, our, our biggest um, levers for success is getting our team united to a common goal but getting them very clear on their own goals. How quickly did you scale from that 90 to circa 700 transactions? Uh, so we're in now uh, three and a half years now. So we're at about 700, 750 sales we'll do in this financial year. We doubled the business in the first 90 days. We then doubled it again 90 days later. And we did our five-year plan in six months and our 10-year plan in 13 months. And like, and this is a, a great challenge for a lot of people. I say, you know, there's no way you can achieve a 10-year plan in six months if you don't have a 10-year plan first. Yeah, correct. And so, so this is the whole idea is about like literally having some sort of view of, of, of asking some great questions. And I think it's the great Max Dupree quote, like, who do we intend to be? And, and I say to people, hey, do you want to be the distant number 10 in the market or would you like to be in the top one, two or three? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, look, we, we didn't want to behave like everybody else. And that's not to disrespect anyone in our, in our market in terms of our competitors, but um, we couldn't play the same game that they were playing, which was they had big rent rolls, no debt, um, and um, lots of properties under management, right? And they own their buildings, et cetera. We had absolutely the opposite. So we had to change the rules and what we had to control was what were we capable of doing? So when I look back and I go, okay, well, what was some of the key, you know, key parts of the success? First of all, was actually um, having a real think about who do we need to become and what do we need to do to be able to do our five-year plan in six months or our 10-year plan in 13 months. And then we just broke it down really basic into basics. So what we do every single day, day in, day out, and how do we increase our standards every single opportunity we can in front of a customer. So I love those questions because, you know, when you start thinking about getting more strategic, you know, who do we intend to be? You know, where are we going? How are we actually going to go and get there? Um, Who do we need to have on our team in order to make that happen? What skills do we need to acquire? And then what resources do we need? And you start thinking about those sorts of questions that then actually then gets you to think very differently about the prospect list and sell component, about the people component, about the service component, yes. around what you've got to go and do inside of an organization. And I think that like literally the skill for any leader is, is that to be able to get rid of the learned history and to be able to break free for where you want to go. Were there people on that journey, Con, who at the time would have said no, like there's, there's just no possibility, there's no way that that would happen and you've got to learn how this market works? Or did everyone sort of jump in straight away and, and, and unite around you because of the way that you opened the conversation around who we intended to become? Yeah, great question. Um, I think there was definitely a few people that had some mooring lines that were holding him back because they weren't used to working as a team or as a collective and 
they weren't used to, you know, one-on-ones and team meetings and caravans and, you know, people supporting them at open homes and auctions or transferring buyers across. So there was definitely um, trust that had to be earned first. Um, some of those people are no longer in the business because they just couldn't um, work as a collective in, in terms of being able to to, to drop the uh, preconceived ideas of how real estate needs to become. Um I think the biggest change that happened though, Josh, is very rapidly people's success, the existing cohort of people and then the people that were joining us, the success was instantaneous. So new set of rules. We drop all the learnt behaviour. We actually work collective as a team. We've got a really good plan. Uh, We've got great coaching, training, energy, culture. We're all supporting one another. We get one really good listing. We, We have a great auction campaign, a great result, and we layer that. And then very quickly, the people that were kind of passengers, uh, they jumped on board very, very quickly. And uh, now they're the ones that are pushing forward really well. Experiences that rapidly shaped you. Con, you know, there's a great story. I remember that as a young child, I I started with my dad um, when I was six years old, you know, going into the office. And on a Saturday morning or even, you know, sometimes uh, maybe late after school, um, if no one was around and I had 30 or 40 cents, I'd I'd whip down to Greg's Takeaway, which is a couple of doors up from my dad's office at the time. That story's still there today. And I go in and and I get a potato cake. And, you know, I knew that if I ordered one, I'd get two. Yeah. You know, and it was so good, good because I kind of, I'd, I'd eat one on the way back <laughs> to the office so that when dad saw me, I only had one, yeah. you know, like literally. And this is, it was such a great guilty little pleasure as a little kid. And you know, they used to call me the potato cake kid back then. It was, it was, it was fascinating. It was so great. Anyway, this story, you know, winds back 17 years later and dad's in listing Greg's house to sell it. Right. And uh, so dad's there and whatever the fee of the day was, let's call it 2% or whatever. And, and Greg turns to dad and goes, no, 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 that won't be the fee. And dad's like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, like, <laughs> he goes, do you know, I've been giving your son two for one on potato cakes for years. <laughs> so the fee's going to be 1%. <laughs> and that was exactly what happened. And, and it was a massive lesson about, you know, provide significant value in invoice second and, and, and always learn how to negotiate. But I think that this is an important conversation. It's like, you know, values are a really important driver. Um, you've got a great one too about um, the day yeah. that you got in contact with a billionaire. How yeah. Yeah. Well, out. this is recently, actually, Josh. By the way, there are potato scallops. We're both from Victoria, <laughs> yeah, so right. we're p- potato cakes, the scallops. Yeah. But isn't that amazing? That, you know, Greg, that's a micro moment that he created. Yeah, sure. So that joy of you being able to go there and, you know, buy one for 30 or 40 cents and you get another one. How good. Um, yeah, recently I was contacted by um, by by one of Australia's uh, wealthiest um, uh people. Um, we, um, we did some business with them and, uh, we had a bit of a poor experience, which we actually hadn't communicated back. Uh, this, this business employs over two and a half thousand people. Uh, imagine my surprise driving one day when I get a call from this gentleman and he said, my name is, and, uh, I believe that you've had a poor experience in our organization. I wanted to call and apologize, but more importantly, I wanted to uncover and find out why. Uh, and, uh, my response was, you know, kind of, wow, I was kind of taken back. Um, and, um, I said, the fact that you've called is probably more than enough. I mean, you've got CEOs and general managers and head of operations, et cetera. And I mean, this person actually took the time to drive to see my operations team in Parramatta and wrote down notes about how they were going to make sure that this didn't happen. What it got me thinking about was rather than running away from complaints, whether they're property management, you know, landlords, tenants, buyers, sellers, internal, your own internal customers, sales agents, et cetera, um, run towards them. So the valuable lesson that I got out of that person or that gentleman was, um, if it's happening to one, it may be happening to all and the details matter. Something that's changing your view. You know, Con, I was reading this, uh, this conversation the other day that the, the greatest thing is that they say that once you get to 40, you're now apparently middle-aged. Oh, wow. And the interesting conversation is that you're in significant progressive decline. Wow. And I'm not sure I enjoyed reading this book at this point, and, but there was an interesting part in it and it kind of said that literally they say that one of the biggest fears for people as they get older is that they, be, they feel that they become irrelevant as they grow old. And I started to think a little bit about that because age is not about, you know, progressive decline, but rather a chance to repack the backpack. And there's another great conversation too, that imagine that you go and you take a backpack right now and you unzip it. And that backpack that you're carrying has got everything that's going on in your life. And you literally, and you go and place that over the table. What are the items that you're going to go and repack in that backpack? What are the things that you're not going to pack? And what are the new things that you need to add for the next journey that you're going on? Yeah, great. And I think it's a really great metaphor for like, how much weight are you carrying about previous situations? Situations, previous versions of yourself, issues, challenges, things that might have been going on for you at a particular point in time that you just no need to no longer need to carry with you. Yeah. I and starting that. to think differently about, you know, what do you need next for who you intend to become? Yeah, great. Love that. Uh, I read a really good quote the other day from Ned Brockman, which was, if you can endure, 
endure. And for me, it's about, you know, sometimes if you've ever traveled internationally and you haven't had the privilege of being in, in business class and you've had to go economy class, you've got to get there early, you've got to queue up, you, you know, you're going to be cramped, you're going to eat crappy food and, you know, the toilet's going to be blocked, all that sort of stuff. You'll hit some turbulence, but when you get to your destination, that's where the joy is, right? So that enduring thing for me, I read that from Ned and I was like, you know what, sometimes um, it gets a little bit tough, but at the end of the day, it's worth it if you can endure and push through it. Because that's where all the magic happens on the other side of that. So uh, that that uh, that took a, I, I took a lot of, uh, out of that. You know, it's that old school too. You know, like um, everything in life that you want is just outside of your comfort zone. Yeah, and, and just and being prepared to like you know push. Like if, it, if it's uncomfortable, you're probably in exactly the right place that you need to be for the type of person that you're destined to become. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what's the discomfort that we have in real estate, really? There's not that. Too, there's not too many. Pick up the phone, make a call, get a bit of a rejection every now and then. Maybe role play in front of someone. There's not too much discomfort. So, if you can endure, endure. 